right, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the GDIY Profile. My guest this time is Derek Whitlib. Derek, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm, I'm doing great. You know, I, I got to tell you what a pleasure it is to be uh, on the podcast that's 100% responsible for sending me down the podcast rabbit hole. So <laughs> thanks for that. So was this the first podcast you ever listened to in, in any industry or, or subject matter, I guess I should say? You know what? Two years ago, the, the Gen Xer in me knew what a podcast was, but had not listened to one. And then uh, this one came around just at the right time when I was ready to start um, thinking about how to train my first pointing dog. So it worked out just right. <laughs> and I didn't ruin the world of podcasts for you, apparently. No, like I said, it just created a whole rabbit hole. Now I got you know my deck of podcasts on my phone and uh as a result, um, my, my, my Canadian family is pretty used to when they hop in the truck with me and I, the Bluetooth kicks in, they're greeted by uh, Nick Adair's mellow Tennessee voice. <laughs> <laughs> the, sw- the smooth, velvety tones of a, of a Tennessee boy. Well, I, yeah. I, I don't know whether to, to thank you or apologize to you or, or what for sending you down the rabbit hole podcast. You know, it's a wealth of knowledge, but man, it's a time suck once you really get, get going and find a whole bunch that kind of resonates with you. No, uh, you know what? I listen to him on the drive, so it works out just great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, do you do you recall where you found me at? Was it social media? Did somebody recommend? I'm kind of curious how people kind of come across the podcast nowadays. No, I, I do remember it. It was um, something came across my Facebook feed, "Gun Dog It Yourself," and and uh, I thought, oh, great! It's it's going to be a Facebook page, you know, sort of you know, question and answer sort of forum, or maybe a website. And uh, then when I was ready to look into it, podcast, ah, heck, what the heck is that? Here we go. (laughs) Down the rabbit hole we go. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Do you recall how, about how long ago was this? A little less than two years ago. Okay. So you've been with me for a little while. A little while. Yeah. But uh, when I started listening, the the OCD in me um, made me start with episode one and uh, progress sequentially from there, which kind of worked out really good because uh, early on, I remember you, you guys saying something and, and uh, you had a partner as a Harold. Uh, well, so at the very start, we had Austin and oh, then, that was it. Okay. yeah, we had Austin at the very start. Then we had Adam and then Harold kind of checked in from time to time. And then there was right. Joe, you know, kind of in and out of every now and again too. So we've had a few other guys kind of uh, staples throughout the years. Okay. But what really resonated was you kind of started out saying, you know, we're a couple of guys. We've trained a couple of dogs on our own. We're going through NAVDA and, um, you know, decided to start talking about the stuff that we wish people had told us when we started out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just, you know, the perfect spot for me in terms of where I was trying to, uh, you know, gain all this huge volume of knowledge that goes into overcomplicating the training of a pointing dog. Yeah. Getting hit by the fire hose essentially when you get your first one. So, so is that when you kind of found it and started listening to it when you got your first one or did did you start listening before you brought the first one home? Oh, there was a, there was a solid um, year, maybe 10 months to a year of listening to it before the dog even came in the house. (laughs) All right. And did you think that it, it, because you were researching it and downloading all that information, did it, do you feel like it made the transition into your first dog a little bit smoother or at least a little bit more confident for you, I guess? Definitely. Right. There's some foundational stuff that was really helpful, you know, in between, um, um, you guys and, uh, the sort of, um, um, collection of, um, friends and more experienced dog handlers that I, that I've got to know over the years, um, made it a lot easier to at least feel like I'm reasonably ready, um, to start working with, with a pointing dog, um, had a lab before that, that pretty much exclusively used for upland. I'm not much of a waterfowler anymore. And, and I've always had beagles, but, uh, the pointing dog, you know, was, again, was a whole new adventure. Awesome. Well, I want to go down the, the, the path, your dog path into the pointing dog world. But first, let's go ahead and start off, kind of tell everybody where you're calling from to begin with and what kind of dogs you currently have now. You said a pointing dog, but we, we kind of have an eerily similar uh, uh, dog of the same age in the, in the house, if you will. 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm from Ontario, Canada, and to sort of put it on the map, I'm in a little. Uh, my family and I are in a little one traffic light town, about one hour's drive north of Toronto. And uh, the pointing dog I'm talking about is our 16-month-old Llewellyn setter named Leia. Mm. Which looks eerily similar to my own and which is the same age. And so I know you and I were kind of swapping messages back and forth when we both got the puppies. And and uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how just... It, the, the dog world is such a small world. And of course, you know, dogs, it's you're in Canada, I'm in the U S but they look eerily similar. Of course, mine's not a Llewellyn. So, uh, being able to kind of watch you develop over the first year and a half, I guess, uh, of the puppy's life and kind of contrasting that against my, my girl Quinn, it's been kind of fun doing the social media, uh, check in every now and again. Yeah, for sure. And you know what, as much as I kind of like to have fun with, the uh, um, the Llewellyn um, setter identity. I got to be honest with you. I can't tell the difference between a Llewellyn and an English setter, but I have met people who swear they can. Oh yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, there's so many breeds out there that uh, people will get caught up in, in, in specific lines and, you know, oh, this is a, this is a wire hair, not a draught and then vice versa. And, and uh, of course there's actual distinguishing uh, there, there's actual differences amongst them but to the untrained eye or the person just kind of looking at it from afar it doesn't mean much to them the funny thing is though you know and you can maybe relate you know walking around in public with the dog um i've had lots of people come up to me ask me what kind of dog it is or ask me if that's some sort of a long-haired dalmatian <laughs> um, i've gotten the same thing <laughs> yeah i'll bet um i've never had anyone come up and ask me or say that's an english setter but on two separate occasions, I've had people come up to me and matter of factly say, that's a Llewellyn setter. I was blown away. Yeah. Like I said, I can't tell the difference, but I like to joke that uh, the way you can tell the difference is the Llewellyn holds its nose a little higher in the air. That's all. <laughs> well, I, I want to circle back to what you're kind of uh all, just touched on briefly for a second. You you said that you'd had a lab, but then you also had a bunch of beagles, uh, but you're primarily an upland hunter. So I need a little bit more background. I want to flush this out and round it out a little bit better. Talk to me about your upbringing. Where did, where did the hunting start? Where did the interest in upland hunting come from? And where did the beagles and lab kind of fall into this? And then tell me where where the interest for an actual pointing dog that, that is more typical of the upland hunter, uh, hunting focus, wh where did all this kind of develop and, and, uh, begin? Yeah, a bit of an unusual route. Um, did not grow up in a hunting family, but, uh, my dad fished and, uh, supported my hunting addiction, which I, I picked up at an early age. Uh, my family had a um, a cabin or a cottage or a camp, depending on which uh, geography you're from, you'll call it a different thing, but it was, <laughs> it was on a lake and it gave me access to um, um, unlimited public land, what we call crown land here in Ontario. So um, I grew up um, without a hunting dog, but hunting grouse and hares um, up there, up north, a little north of where I am. And uh, actually shot my first roughed gross at the age of 12 um shot it with a 177 caliber air rifle i mean i stalked that <laughs> gross like a lion i still remember it. it was under a spruce tree and i'm i'm pretty sure i was in the prone position um when i got it um very sportsman but, of you <laughs> yeah 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 for sure i guess any 12 year old and, uh, boy would do the same thing given the same situation yeah and, and you know what i was so proud my my dad he mounted the wings of the grouse on an old board and, you know, I, I still got it. Okay. Got the wings of the, the first grouse I ever shot. Um, no tail fan, just the wings? Just the wings. Didn't think to keep the tail fan for some reason. Um, but like I said, we didn't have hunting dogs growing up either. We had various lovable mutts. Um, and then my family went through a Yorkshire Terrier phase, which I'd, I'd rather not talk about. <laughs> and, uh, All right. Um, but um going through high school had buddies that had beagles so we spent every saturday from december to february chasing cottontails and a little bit of snowshoe hair with beagles and uh, fell in love with that game and beagles and then uh um through my adult life i've always had had a beagle and uh have one to this day um a little bit of rabbit hunting with it and um also live in a 
part of Ontario where actually um, a longstanding tradition and legal pastime is hunting deer with hounds. So we'll run that beagle on, on deer um, for a week in November um, as well. Um, the lab came along though, because my wife grew up having labs and uh, always wanted one. So I thought, okay, I kind of already th thought I wanted a bird dog and probably a pointing dog, but I can work with a lab and that's great. And uh, we had her for 10 years. And although she uh, passed away a little unexpectedly, shot a lot of uh, woodcock, ruffed grouse and pheasants uh, in front of her. And at that time, the flushing dog um, style of hunting suited me just fine for a guy that was used to busting through the briars after cottontails. So walking right behind the dog into the thick of it, you know, to flush along with the dog was just uh, a okay. And I got to admit now um, with my first hunting season under my belt with my pointing dog, um, I, I still have to remind myself that I don't necessarily have to walk in the middle of every thicket backwards to just to get through it. Right. Now that, that is a very big uh, benefit or plus to a pointing dog that, that is properly developed. Now, if you, if you never develop your pointing dog to actually bu bust the cover while you stay out of it, then you might end up with a pointing dog that just stays out of the cover and then you're not finding a whole bunch of birds. But you know, if you, if you do it right and step it on up correctly and, and you, you know, develop and expose them the correct way at an early age, it is pretty nice being able to just cast your dog in the cover. And then heck, it kind of gets to where you never even have to cast them. They just know this is where the birds live and they go in on their own. Yeah. And, and that was a training detail that I picked up from a variety of sources, including my breeder and, and probably from this podcast and things I'd read, you know, from an early age to start those puppy walks or those nature walks in the cover, starting in, you know, in the fields and the tall grass and, and working up from there. And then the, it wasn't long before the, the pups started realizing that, you know, it was in the thick stuff where the interesting sights and smells were likely to be found. So um, certainly don't have a problem now with, with the dog, uh, diving in Ex except sometimes at the end of the day when she gets a little tired and lazy yeah she gets a little brush sore and just you know yeah. it's, it's like ah, i've been busting all day it's it, she she's looking for that trail bird the same way as you on the way back to the truck <laughs> yeah usually that time the setter tail has that red tip that you probably know yep. yeah know it all too well have, have you tried doing anything with the the tail the tip of the tail i know some people use that tape i can't recall the name of it off the top of my head but have you messed with that at all or just not even a concern for you at this point no i haven't i've heard of it um just tried to make sure i tend to the tail clean it up at the end of the day and it hasn't been uh been a problem yet but i could see you know if i was on a you know week-long western trip or something i'd probably have to uh, be a little more attentive to um, both treating it and to some preventive measures. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty much the same approach uh, that I've been taking uh, with Quinn's. Uh, so tell me, you, you developed the love for for the upland. You had the lab. You transitioned into the pointing dogs. What what's your main targets? What are you after? You you mentioned rough grouse. Is that your main focus and passion? Yeah, I mean, when you talk about upland hunting in Ontario, uh, it's first and foremost uh, roughed grouse. Um, they're quite common through most of the province. Um, also, woodcock, obviously, when the migration's uh, coming through, the woodcock hunting can be quite, quite good. Um, then um, in terms of other upland, huntable upland game birds around here, um, there's pretty much next to no wild ring-necked pheasants uh, left. There are some pockets hanging around, but having said that, um, a lot of pheasant hunting goes on in the form of released birds on public land or, in a, and of course, pheasant preserves. Um, yeah. Was hoping, did a did a trip up uh, north back in October for some rough grouse, and we were hoping to get into some spruce grouse there. Um, it wouldn't have been unusual, but well, we didn't see any of those um, at that time. And there's actually also... Um, some pockets of sharp tails that some people actively hunt. Um, again, they're a little further north of me, um, but uh, would love the opportunity to get on those as, as well. Um, it's quite diverse, actually. Like Ontario is huge. Like you could actually fit uh, Texas, Montana, and maybe a couple of New England states within Ontario. And and that geography means that at the at the far south, we actually have native bobwhite quail. 
Um, they're an endangered species. Um, there's never been a hunting season in, in my lifetime, but um, um, I know people who recall flushing coveys of quail as kids. Um, and then you to the other extreme, you go to the far north, and um, there's two or three species of ptarmigan. Um, I don't know anyone who's hunted them only because you, you can't get there, at least not by a car. Right. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the only people who hunt ptarmigan in Ontario are either uh, uh, people who live in, in the Inuit communities up there or, um, you know, uh, a fly-in caribou hunter who's looking for some time to kill. <laughs> well, ptarmigan, you know, that that's something I got to experience earlier season down here in Colorado and and just the elevation that it takes to get up there. And then I can, I can only imagine as far North as you guys are in this time of year. Yeah. It's uh, the accessibility I would assume would, would prevent anybody that would have an interest from really trying that unless it, like you said, they can just, that they have the resources to be able to fly in and do it, do it that way. Yeah. Now that I think about it, even caribou, um, you'd have to go into Quebec to hunt caribou. I'm not in Ontario. And like I said, I've heard of guys, you know, during downtime, hot in a few ptarmigan, um, but it's not something that I know anyone's uh, actively uh, pursued. Yeah. So, so rough grouse and woodcock, that's primarily been, been your, uh, your MO. That's, that's what you're targeting. Talk to me about the development of, of your little setter pup, you know, how she been, talk to me about the steps and just kind of catch us up on where she actually is in, in the uh, progression. Yeah, just got our first hunting season under her belt. Um, you know, she, she was born in, in August of uh, 2023. So, you know, hunting season, uh, you know, came around. She was about four months old. So we didn't we didn't hunt her, in, uh, or sorry, August 2022. So we didn't hunt her in the 2022 fall season. Um, just worked on the development. Um, but use that opportunity to try and expose her again, those puppy walks out there in the bush and um, started getting onto some woodcock, which um, probably don't got to tell you are a great training bird. Uh, I know I've heard it said that sometimes woodcock don't always make the best for the best grouse dog, but you know, for a pup that's um, just learning it to point and that sort of thing, that's been uh, fabulous. Um, I think, I think they're great for sparking the flame for getting that drive, connecting the dots that there are birds in those woods. Like you said, on a puppy walk, it's like, oh, there's actual game in here and connecting some dots. When you kind of get into that, to that upper echelon and you're trying to develop that dog that can consistently really work those tough, rough grouse birds. Uh, I, I think, I think that they can be a little detrimental if you have a dog that's crowding them. Not every dog has that problem. Some dogs just naturally respect them like every other bird. But if you have a dog that's constantly crowding them and bumping them and, and not respecting them, that can create a bit of a headache on rough grouse when they start dealing with some running birds. Yeah, and we're still certainly trying to struggle our way through, you know, handling grouse. They're they're a pretty challenging uh, bird, to say the least, the um, the other thing about Woodcock that was super helpful was, uh, I mean, she was doing a lot of busting and chasing a Woodcock um, at a young age. And and she would also, um, or when she did point, she initially would not let me get ahead of her to flush the bird, right? She'd break as soon as I came in line with, with her. Um, but I was using those opportunities with a starter pistol when she when she would chase the birds to start exposing her to gun while she was distracted with the, the fun of the chase. And, and uh, that was an effective way of getting her used to, um, um, that, but you know what, even that was preceded by, um, you know, we'd do our little puppy retrieves in the house down the corridor on dummies and stuff. And, uh, you know, toss the dummy, uh, clap my hands, right. Just to put a little sound to it and building up from there. Then we went from that to a couple of two by four blocks, tossing a dummy outside, banging the blocks together. Right progressed up to the starter pistol that I mentioned. So when the time finally came to uh, uh, the opportunity presented itself to exposure, exposure to some gunfire during NAVDA training, um, the, the exposure to gun was, was not an issue at all. That just went really smoothly. Nice. Yeah. You can't ever be too careful on that or, or go too slow because I tell everybody like, 
you know, some people, some, some people, I swear, even after listening to this, you know, there, there was a guy I spoke to about a month or two ago and he just reached out and uh fan of the podcast. And, and he was just like, yeah, you know, I, the, the one advice that y- y'all gave, gave me that, uh, I didn't really take. And it wasn't that big of a deal was, uh, intro gunfire intro. We, we just went to the gun range and, and, uh, he was fine. So I, I don't think that it was that big of a deal. I'm like, well, you got lucky. <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you can take the gamble, but if you, if the gamble is wrong, then you, you're, man, I, I just don't want to deal with breaking of, uh, or improving a gun shy dog. It's just, uh, man, it's, it sucks to deal with that. So just avoid it at all costs if you can. Yeah. We, we create enough problems of our own doing and, uh, but, but gun shyness, from what I understand, is one of the harder ones to fix. So rather avoid that. Yeah, it takes a lot of time, a lot of birds. And then if you have a dog that all of a sudden becomes shy of birds and they're gun shy, well, you got you got a big issue on your hands right there. So so you, you Woodcock was a great exposure, kind of great entryway into the woods. Uh, how did the rest of the season work out for you? Well, the, the other thing we did when... when uh the setter was still a pup was um, I took her to a game farm and this, this is um, the sire's owner. So her sire is a, is a, is a staff dog at a game farm. And uh, I called him up and was looking for some exposure to birds. Cause although she's seen some woodcocks, she hadn't really been up close and personal with birds. And he said, no problem. Come out. And he, um, he got me a, a dozen Bob white quail. And uh and uh, the first one, he just ha- he was just holding this quail in his hands, sitting on a chair. And uh, when she, I don't know if she caught the sound of it or the scent of it, but next thing you know, she almost jumped in his lap and ripped the quail <laughs> out of his hands. Um, the next one, uh, or maybe it was that same bird, he let it fly around the barn. And she just had a good old time chasing the bird around the barn for a while until she, you know, captured it and dominated it. And then from there, we went, went out in the field, sort of did something similar to a, a positive pigeon kind of drill except using quail, um, letting her watch them fly off and, and then finally planted a couple of quail, let her find them and point them. And that was, you know, the first sort of puppy points, real good puppy points that I saw out of her. And I thought that was just a really, really great way of, uh, you know, introducing her up close with a bird that wasn't going to, you know, you know, spur her or, or flap wings in her face and startle the pup. So that worked out really well for us. Yeah. And does it, does it get any better than a young setter pup going on point for the first time? Yeah. I, I, I gotta admit full disclosure at an early age, just for uh giggles. I tried the wing on a string knowing that it's got probably little to no training value <laughs> and um, it didn't work out at, at all. It was like a, a cat <laughs> chasing a cat toy. Um, so I'm sure the dog had fun, but I, you know, I didn't get that, uh, that perfect puppy point photo that I was hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. That, that wing on a string, man, it's, uh, like you said, it, it, it's something fun to try and, and do, but, uh, yeah, don't go into it thinking that you're doing any kind of serious training, but it is fun to watch. I mean, it is fun always seeing a puppy just kind of lock up on it, but it doesn't sound like you, you got that, that result on your end. Um, but to answer your question before we actually got into her first, uh, bird season which was this fall which we just wound up um we went through a season of uh navda and uh that was a really great great experience made some mistakes um but um that really prepared the dog and and helped you know steady things up and um and also showed me what things i needed to work on um with her as well um so by the time we uh, got to the end of the training season you know you know started out just started the season you know just working on on pointing and steadiness and search and then of course by the end of the training season we were shooting uh birds over uh mostly chuckers and uh um thought we were heading into the season real strong she was um you know staunch on point um you know steady to wing and shot at that point i wasn't doing any retrieving with her yet um but when we got into the the woodcock season, which here starts September 25th, um, that all seemed to go out the window. <laughs> um, she re- reverted right back to um, uh, breaking when I tried to get in front of her to flush. And uh, I was, you know, 
a little concerned with that. But uh, one of the great things about NAVDA is you, you meet a lot of contacts. And if you kind of keep your eyes and ears open, I kind of developed a network of uh, sort of some phone a friend buddies who had a lot more experience in dogs than I than I do. And, um, and uh, one of them reassured me that you know what? She knows what she's supposed to do. Don't worry about her breaking. He gave me a couple tips to kind of correct that a little bit. And he goes, don't be surprised if all it takes is a little bit of correction. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. Um, now, having said that, um, what I got her, I've got her to the point where I can reliably um, flush birds in front of her. This first season, I have not worried about her being steady to wing and shot as long as she was staunch on point. Uh, and let me flush and I try to show uh, some discipline, although I got to admit I wasn't perfect in, you know, only shooting sort of quality pointed birds. Uh, but um, so really happy with with the way um, um, that's that's worked out. The other thing it, it taught me was um, to trust my dog, um, started reading her body language, everything from the position of the tail to, you know, how staunch she was on point. And um, I quickly learned that if I went in for the flush and she did break, to let her break because, um, you know, 19 times out of 20, she was repositioning on a bird that was no longer there. And when she was staunch on point, when she is staunch on point, that tells me there is a bird there. And again, 19 times out of 20, there's a bird there in that case. So she taught me to, to trust her when she does re choose to self-relocate because there's usually a reason for it. And I don't know how well that would translate into sort of um, a trial or testing scenario, but uh, it really works well for our, for our hunting style. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, obviously you've listened to us for a while, so you're kind of aware of, of my thought process on this, but I, I'm a huge fan of allowing the dog to learn how much space to give the birds and to self relocate, especially on running birds. You know, it's by the time that dog goes on point, especially if you're relying on a tracking collar or anything like that to, to kind of bring you in by the time you actually get to them, that bird could have run a good long ways. And so if you're, if you're trying to control the, the entire thing and you require that dog to stand still and you give it a, a strong, whoa, that bird could be long gone and then you think that it's a non-productive point. But meanwhile, if you just trust your dog and understand that this is a wild bird, worst case scenario, they bump the bird and you don't get the bird. Okay, who cares? I'm playing the long game here. I want the dog that's going to hunt well for me for the next 10 years, more so than I want this one particular bird, right? So if you let them relocate and learn that on their own, then you have a dog that you can trust and, and their judgment on how much pressure to put on that bird and how much not to. And, uh, and then honestly, like I, I can't think of another scenario with just one dog on the ground that's more entertaining and just beautiful to watch than a dog that, you know, that dance between dog and bird is something magical when you get to see them kind of playing their chess game. And then when they're done, then we can jump in there and do our part. But I just love watching a dog that knows how to self relocate and hunt that bird without me having to control it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it really, uh, it, it's a real, real partnership. And um, it's certainly different than, um, you know, hunting rabbits or, or, or deer in my case with a beagle where, uh, you know, the, the dog really works independent of you. So it, it's really fun. That's for sure. Yeah. So I got to I got to ask when they you weren't allowed to get in front of with the dog without her busting. How were you flushing? Were you coming up behind them and right beside her or were you circling around perpendicular? Kind of kind of walk me through the element of of what you noticed was actually causing her to break or when she would break. Well, it's an interesting question because um, you mentioned earlier drinking from the fire hose and um, you'll never, you weren't, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I got conflicting advice on that, on that detail on how to approach the there, dog. There's never any conflictions in the gun dog world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of it was dictated by cover. I mean, a lot of these training birds were 
wild birds were woodcock and sometimes there was no choice but to come up right behind the dog um, in which case I'm certain she just viewed me as competition right and wanted to get to the bird be before I, I did um, but getting around the dog hooking around and coming in from the side or or coming um, from the front right at the dog um, helped uh, a little bit in the steadiness for sure um, but what I found like I said she had that NAVDA foundation already and and um, and working under the assumption, as my my buddy told me, that she she probably knows what she's supposed to do. She's just getting excited with with wild bird scent. Um, I was really hesitant to use any sort of e collar pressure when she was on on point. Um, but what he what he told me to do, he said, just you know, obviously use the lowest setting that gets any you know sort of acknowledgement from the dog. And when she goes to break, just a tap 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 um uh, on it like not a continuous stim just give it a little tap and if it doesn't look good like it's going right get off the e-collar just stop it but um you know what one or two birds just a light tap tap when she broke and and that was all it took and in in one afternoon um she went from you know not letting me get in front of her to um staying staunch on point no matter which direction um i came from and uh and he was right. She knew what the rules of the game were. She was just getting kind of over enthusiastic uh, with, you know, a scent, a nose full of wild bird scent. Well, and that and that's the key. She has to know that what she's supposed to do, right? So if you go out there, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they just have a brand new puppy and they go out and and the dog's just not holding point for you and you go hitting it with the e collar, you're going to develop a whole can of worms that you, you you don't want to mess with that but because she knew the expectation that correction actually had meaning and i'm curious have had you developed that point of contact or or exposed her to the e-collar prior to that so it like this wasn't the first instance that she had the e-collar on correct no i you know initially i i i had the e-collar with with the lab and had some experience with proper introduction to e-collar um and by then i'd exposed her also using a, a gradual intro to e-collar but mostly for the purposes of of recall um early in the puppy stage she she got to that point and i don't know if you can relate nick when she she got the courage and next thing you know she went from being a bootlicker um to I'm looking at the GPS and she's 400 yards away. <laughs> and, uh, and the next thing I know, there's a herd of deer running by coming from her direction. Um, so when she started ranging really far, I thought, okay, um, we're going to start doing some introduction to call her just in case I need to stop her or, or um, uh, enforce some recall. So she'd had that sort of exposure. Um, but really I hadn't used the collar much on her at all until uh, we, we got into the, um, trying to maintain the staunchness on point. Yeah. No, that, that, that's the main thing I try and tell everybody is like, just don't slap an e-collar on for the first time and go out there and, and use it. it is to, to use an e-collar correctly. It, it actually has to have some meaning. It has to lose its novelty. The dog has to understand that the e-collar is a correction in, in this scenario or in this instance. And you can only do that in the training field before you get into that situation. So don't just go out there. Don't take this piece of advice and, and just be like, Oh, I've never put an e-collar on, but I'm going to go fix this staunchness. My dog's going to let me hold point. You, you, you can create a, a, a big problem with that potentially uh, if you don't know what you're, what you're doing on that one. But I'm curious the conflicting uh, response in terms of the flushing. I want to hear, hear the thought process on coming up beside them or perpendicular or circling around. What, what were you being told from somebody else? You got, you have me a little curious on this now. Yeah, no, I, I distinctly remember in, uh, in the training field, I came around, I hooked around the front of the dog and it was essentially either coming right at her or kind of quartering to her and um, was told, no, no, come up beside her. I don't want to, you don't want to flush the bird and have it fly into the dog's face was the advice I got. And, uh, by then, you know, I wasn't too worried about that. The dog had, an, uh, had had enough exposure to birds that I wasn't worried about her getting startled, but, uh, 
you know what, when you're, when you're, when you're surrounded by guys with a lot of experience, just, you know, keeping quiet and keeping your ears open and listening and uh, filtering the advice is better. I think sometimes than then, you know, I'm not going to tell a guy who's, you know, um, trained a versatile champion that no, he's wrong. I shouldn't, you know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with coming up um, straight at the dog. I mean, I'd say that that's, that's not a bad advice when you're dealing with pen race birds. I mean, it, you know, wild birds and pen raised birds are, are completely different. Let's face it, pen raised birds are they, they don't exactly have the the highest survival instinct uh, within them. So you do have a lot of pen raised birds where I've seen them jump into specifically my short hair's mouth quite a bit. It seems like whenever that's going to happen, it's always her on the ground. Which knock on wood, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't want that happening to my pup or or my Munstie. That would just unravel the Munstie. Good lord, if she caught one bird in the training field, then you can sure as heck bet every bird after that's getting busted. <laughs> well, and, 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 and you know what, I think that's where that advice was, was coming from. And, and it, and it, um, it was well, well founded. Um, cause, um, um, you know, I, I've never been one in the training of my dog, you know, to shy away from, um, letting her catch a bird through some of the early exposure. Um, um, but there can be too much of a good thing, at least in my limited experience. And where I did get myself in, into trouble um, was um, through some poor flying chuckers. And, uh, um, you know, I was so enamored with seeing her point um, some of these birds, um, leftover birds in the training field, that I kind of turned a blind eye to um, the fact that she was uh, chasing and catching some of them afterwards. And then I found myself working to undo some bad habits that, that, that came out of that. Um, probably, uh, I've probably had to spend more time dealing with a bit of a hard mouth than I would have had to otherwise after, um, <laughs> you know, she got to hide under a bush and chomp on a chucker or two. Uh Oh yeah. No, that's, that's always a consideration. And, and, uh, real quick, just to, to round this particular uh, subject out, when I'm dealing with pen raised birds and even in a testing environment, I prefer uh, perpendicular, so 90 degree angle. And the reason why is I don't like circling back around for the reason you just suggested is it pushes the bird right back at the dog. But I don't like coming up from behind either, because especially if you're working steadiness, if you kick that bird straight out and you're shooting it or a gunner shooting it, what, what have you, that dog's behind you. And so it can lose sight of the bird. And so that dog might lose, might break from its point and where it's supposed to be holding steady to at least get a better view and relocate and mark the down bird. But anytime you allow that, that gray area for them to move their feet, that that's an opportunity for them to think that it's okay to take additional steps and cheat even more. Right. And so I like doing the perpendicular come at a 90 degree and then they have a nice clear view of that bird taking off. And, uh, there, there's no relocating, uh, allowed in that instance. But, uh, anyway, this, you know, that's, that's a topic for another day. We can explore that, uh, later on. I want to hear what I, I ask everybody on the, on the profile episodes. I want to start with your biggest mistake that you've made and learned from that. Uh, yeah, just, just give me that your biggest mistake that you've made so far. Yeah. I, I think the one I touched on already was, um, you know, letting her catch too many chuckers. Um, and like I said, that created a little bit of work to, to undo that. And thankfully, um, you know, she's now reliably bringing back birds. I no longer have to worry about her hiding under a bush and, uh, and feasting on a bird. Um, but again, the mouth is a little, little harder than, than I was used to with my lab anyways. So still got to work on, on that. And that kind of takes me probably to my next, um, mistake, which I think was trying to introduce force fetch a little too soon. Um, developmentally physical developmentally you know the dog was uh, probably about 10 months old um you know puppy teeth long gone um had done a bunch of work with her and um um thought i'd try force fetch as a means to deal with with the hard mouth but quickly realized um she wasn't doing well under the pressure of force fetch we we're doing an ear pinch um and uh, started seeing some body language that was real indicative of some anxiety you know a lot of 
all of a sudden she'd get really itchy and do a lot of scratching and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, you know what? I looked at where we were in our training season. I looked at how far out we were from uh, from hunting season, which was probably only about a month out at that point. And I thought, well, I got a month to work on some stuff. And uh, the hard mouth isn't as big a concern for me right now. So we went back to working on some of the, the steadiness and, and and some exposure to bird bird stuff. What I did do in 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 lieu of force fetch though and not to say i won't revisit it someday but we just worked on um the hold conditioning part of it right so a lot of a lot of hold and a lot of hold and carry starting with various objects and bumpers and then um to frozen birds and even some live shot birds um afterwards and um you know i think it's um it's the folks at at perfection kennel and i know they're um you know, one of your podcast guests, and I picked up something from from them that talked about, you know, if 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 their mind is busy, their mouth won't be. So if you're doing a hold and carry with the dog, or uh, for example, we've done hold and carry and and walked her through on heel through a bit of an obstacle course I created in the backyard. Um, suddenly she's carrying the bird around, but she's not chomping on it. She's she's focused on other parts of the exercise and. And that seems to be uh, alleviating that situation a whole lot. Yeah, I love I love tips like that. I mean, just little little scenarios like that. Just just oh, put it in the mouth and and walk around the obstacle course, heal it, whatever. I mean, I, I love that stuff. I think I recall you and I messaging a little bit when you first initially started force fetch. Do I remember that correctly? I think you and I had a, a, a an exchange on that. We're just checking in with puppies and, and you were starting force fetch. And I, I think I remember us talking about it possibly being a little too early. Am I, am yeah, I remembering no, I that do, correctly? I do. I do recall. And, and I think uh, you said you're thinking about maybe trying that, introducing that at some point later. Again, I think you had other priorities that you wanted to, to work on. Yeah. Well, fast forward here. I am. I, I am starting the the very initial hold stages right now. You know, it's uh, we got through the hunting hunting season, and I, I'm a big fan of getting through at least the first real hunting season for a dog before uh, before starting force fetch. Now, there are some out there that take it just fine. You know, to you know each individual dog, but uh, to me, better safe than sorry. You know, what what's it gonna hurt? Get through the first hunting season, uh, but that that's just kind of my approach. Uh, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm also a fan of um, uh, Jeremy Jeremy Moore, dog boat hunter, and, and his you know sort of slow and steady approach to it, and uh, and like I said, that's why I decided we'll park force fetch for now. Um, She's got a decent retrieve. Um, it's not clean, you know. It's not going to win any prizes, but she brings the bird bird to hand, and the bird's intact. And uh, and uh, so so far so good in that department. Yeah. See, and that that's my situation with with my girl Quinn is is she'll bring it back to me. It may not be pretty all the way to heal a good handoff. Uh, she'll do that with birds. She does that with shot birds. But you throw a bumper for her outside, not a chance. You throw a bumper inside for her, she'll go do it. But as soon as she crosses that threshold, she's got one thing on her mind, and that's birds. And and uh, I I can't be upset about that. I mean, that's kind of what we want in, in a lot of ways. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely take that. So uh, I, I, I can I can relate. Um, mine will 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 take bumpers, but she doesn't. You know. Um, retrieve bumpers outside with the same enthusiasm that my lab would have right oh well yeah it's, it's fun for a little bit but uh um wild birds i mean she's got them back in my hand um before you know i even you know realized i, I still got the adrenaline going because i <laughs> shot the bird and it fell and then there's the dog looking at me holding the bird in her mouth well it's it's the same comparison is it go find me a pointing lab that'll point as staunch or as intense as a as a setter and then we can start talking about a setter that retrieves as intense or or as excited as a lab right like that's what labs are for right you know uh but yeah so i the second question i ask everybody on these profiles is give me your your favorite episodes guest topics something that really kind of helped you out and i know that you said that you started from scratch so i'm kind of intrigued to hear out of everything the past four or five years uh what stands out to you in terms of episodes or guests yeah i think the the episode or the series that i listened to and re-listened to the most was was the woe series um and ended up um 
hearing the different techniques and the one that resonated and worked with me was um, place board techniques. So um, did a lot of that. So um, really, really liked that from a practical standpoint. Um, also liked when you interviewed uh, Mo Lindley, um, the Wes Gibbons approach is, is again, something I'm trying to be a bit of a, a student of. Um, I mentioned Perfection Kennel. I think you did an episode uh, with them and they're, I just find them really straightforward. They, they seem to uncomplicate um, the, the training process. And uh, I'd probably remiss if I didn't mention uh, um, your episodes with Kyle Warren. Um, and you know that both, you know, from the Llewellyn component, um, I know he's always been a big fan of Llewellyn's and, and uh, but also um, he's just got some really practical knowledge, both from a dog development standpoint and a grouse hunting and grouse habitat um, standpoint. You can take some of his tips to the bank and apply them in the field and, and uh, sure enough, they work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all those episodes obviously sit at the top of my list as well. And I mean, from a hunting standpoint, you, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that spends more time and, and has more uh, actual experience in the grouse woods than Kyle. But the uh, the Perfection Kennel, that that's one I'm, I'm looking, I'm hopefully that can make it to one of their clinics in person. I, I want to see their their stuff in person, but you, you nailed it. It's kind of like they just uncomplicate things. They, it, it just, they try and keep it simple. It's like, it, it's almost the kiss approach Just keep it simple, stupid. And, uh, and that's why when I was talking to John and kind of getting to know them a little bit, it's, it, that, that was like the only word that just kind of kept coming back and reverberating within my head was just simple, just simple. If it doesn't make sense to you, how can you make it make sense to the dog? And so, uh, that episode was, was, uh, I really enjoyed that one for sure. Yeah. And it, it's good for an amateur handler. Cause you know, you can get overwhelmed with the, the information, the YouTube videos, the training techniques. And, uh, and you know what, I, I, I'm not equipped and not prepared to set up a George Hickox for launcher, you know, pigeon, um, scenario. Um, but, um, there's, there's other things I can take away, um, both from, you know, guys like George Hickox and others. Right. And that's, that's the other thing that I found was, uh, you know what, if you find a training system or, or different things that resonate with you as an amateur handler, I don't think any of us are equipped or capable of following every system through every step, the way the professional does it. Right. They've got the grounds, the equipment, um, the investment, right. We're probably not as don't have the means to do to do that so you find the workarounds right and uh and you kind of go from there and and if you don't uh let it get too complicated it's um it's remarkable what these dogs can do if they have the natural ability right it, it, it's in them and uh and if you just sort of guide that a little bit um um they'll teach you a whole lot yeah. And, and I mean, one, one of the calling calls that I've been saying for years and I actually haven't gotten to say in, in quite a while during the hunting season is as long as you focus on the why instead of the how and you understand the principles and, and why the these pros are doing or these methods are doing things a certain way, you can kind of piecemeal the same scenarios or lessons together with what gear and resources you do have. And, and that is the catalyst for what started this entire podcast was because just like you, you know, I'm very fortunate now and I do have a lot of the equipment and, and, and resources available to me to kind of do any of these methods. But especially just four or five years ago, I did not have any of that. I didn't have a single launcher. I didn't even have a kick trap. I had nothing. It's like, I, I was going out there. It's like, all right, I got a bumper and a leash. Like, what are we doing here? And, uh, and, but yeah, you know, it's like focus on the principles of dog training and, and you, you can make it up as you go along. And so, you know, there's a lot of truth in, especially when you're a new, new person, when people say pick a method and stick with it, that's a very safe thing to advise people on. But to your point, if you don't have the resources or the right people to help you, some methods are, are a little bit more difficult to make happen than, than others. But if you really focus on, well, why is that method effective? Why is that step? Why is the George Hickok scent, scent bird uh, set up? Why, why is that effective? 
you can get real creative in making that happen. And that's why I enjoy bringing all this information to everybody. But to your point, it is complicated or difficult to kind of swim through all of the, the fire hose or spraying you just, I mean, there's a lot of information and, and I, I find myself sometimes I'll even go out and I'll be like, all right, I spoke to this person two weeks ago. I'm fired up on that method, but this method over here, and you, you can start second guessing and triple guessing a lot of things. And then that's why when talking to somebody like John Han at, at Perfection Kennels, it really grounds you and it's like, okay, back to simple. And, uh, yeah, just, I, I love it, man. That's that's why I talk to everybody on a week in week out basis. And, and there's certainly a limit to what you can gain, either, whether from listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video that can't be replaced by anything other than seeing someone or have someone showing you how to do it in the field. And, and that goes back to, I know something you guys, um, had talked about and, and it's advice that I took to heart was, you know, when you're, when you're doing your nav to training day, you know, don't just pack up, put the dog up in the, in the truck and leave after you've, you've done your three birds, um, stick around, right. Um, ask to follow, you know, the next guy around the field, um, observe from a distance. And, and that's when you start seeing those nuances of, of timing, you know, whether it's working the check cord or, or other things, um, that, you know, that's, you just can't pick that up. Um, without seeing it. At least that was what I found. Absolutely. You start realizing, Oh, I, I knew how this is supposed to work, but somehow it wasn't working well for me until I saw this guy do it. And uh, now I get it. Even if that other guy does it wrong, you know, if we can learn by our own mistakes, we can also learn by other people's mistakes as well. So like just standing there and, and, and loading the launcher for them and watching them make a mistake or, or success, either way you're learning. And, and, uh, yeah, it, a lot of good information on, on that and good insight and perspective. And, and Derek, I appreciate your time. I know we went a little bit longer than what we normally do on these profile episodes, but, uh, again, you know, it's just, uh, you reached out. It's it's been a lot of fun, kind of mirroring mirroring our pups and kind of s- comparing the the stages and where they're at and the hunting seasons. And I'm I'm excited to get more updates as we move forward. Yeah, we had a real great sort of wrap up to this season um, just a couple of weeks ago, mid December. I mean, we were still uh, bumping gross and I really hadn't had a really good, um, perfect sort of you know, point shot retrieve all season. We had different combinations of that, but not nothing that, you know, the full uh, secret. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, one day, a couple of weeks ago, we, it was just this great progression. Uh, we, we moved three birds and, and the first one was the typical bump and the bird just was gone. Uh, second bird, about 20 minutes later, she got on this real sort of flaggy point and her head was kind of moving. And I knew the bird was either on the move or wasn't close by. And as I was approaching her, the bird wild flushed. I didn't even see it about 20 yards beyond the dog uh, in some thick spruces. Um, But it just so happened that the bird flushed and flew right over my head. Uh, So um, if you ever tried the, you know, the straight overhead spinning pirouette shot, I don't recommend it. (laughs) Um, So that was an unproductive bird. And then uh, we wrapped up the day. She went on point. Um, I'd lost a battery in my uh, um, GPS, but I knew she was about uh, 40 or 50 yards to my left. Started walking towards her, spotted her on a nice staunch point, tail straight up. She's, you know, still as can be um, looking at me or sort of quartering towards me to my right. So I thought, okay, the bird's slightly to my right between me and her and Walked up, sure enough, about um, got within about 20 yards of the dog and halfway between me and the dog, the grouse come up, perfect going away shot through the, you know, the type of open opening in the trees that you never get in the grouse woods. And and that was the one, you know, where uh, before the, the adrenaline subsided, she was already bringing the bird back to my hand. So we got a real nice photo and, and that'll be, uh, you know, that's one to remember. I'm sure you can relate. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I'm just sitting here smiling. I mean, anytime, anytime you get that first full sequence over a young dog is a win. And then 
the the beautiful thing about that is the next time you go out and then the next it's like that light bulb is is just coming on and flickering and and i love it it's just uh you you can't beat that first dog in that first sequence and success they're tricky birds for sure and and you know in ontario what you gotta understand is we got two kinds of roughed grouse in the northern part of the province you have partridge and uh they're not unlike the birds i've heard of in you know, in, in Maine and perhaps Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and and how, you know, docile and, and tame they can sometimes act. And then uh, in the southern part of the province, including where I live, we, the birds are what uh, some hunters I know call evil southern grouse. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're evil because they seem to get up and walk when you drop the tailgate of the truck. And then, uh, you know, they're flushing 40 yards out, wild flushing before you even get there. So to... Uh, uh, to to get one of those and see a dog handle one of those nicely is, is uh, you put that in the wind column for sure. Yeah, well, and that, those are those are the birds that we're getting our dogs keyed up for. You know, I'm trying to build the dog that can handle the the evil southern grouse as as opposed to the partridge. And yeah, I you, you'll have to keep me updated. I'm excited to to see how you guys kind of move forward as you guys kind of age and, and develop a little bit more. And again, I, I appreciate you taking the time tonight and sharing some, some of your backstory and lessons learned already throughout the past couple of years. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. And uh, good luck with Quinn. Yes, sir. Thank you.